next on Unsolved Mysteries. In South Dakota, a night of partying ends in a terrifying car crash. By the time help arrives, two of the victims have vanished. She is known as Resurrection Mary, a mysterious young woman who is said to haunt the city of Chicago. Is she a ghost or just an urban myth? What caused the crash of TWA Flight 800? The government says it was a design flaw. Conspiracy buffs say there's been a high-level cover-up. And the capture of two vicious armed robbers caught on tape. Murder, missing persons, fugitives, and the paranormal. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. The town of Lake Andes, South Dakota. The road is icy at an intersection on the edge of the Yankton Sioux Indian Reservation. The three occupants of the car have been drinking. The driver is 20-year-old Arnold Archambault. The passengers are his girlfriend, Ruby Bruyer, age 19, and Ruby's cousin, 17-year-old Tracy Dion. We came up to that stop sign. That's all I remember is just him looking and saying there ain't no cars and him spinning out from the stop sign. And it was just like a snap of a finger. Next thing I know, we end up in the ditch. upside down in the ditch and Ruby and I was in the car. Arnold wasn't in the car and I don't know where he was. Ruby was crying. She was saying, oh my God, oh my God. She just kept hitting the car. The next thing I know, the door, it was open a little ways and she had enough room where she slid out. And then so I was going to reach over and then it was just like that. The door went shut. By the time help arrives, Tracy is the only person still in the car. Okay. Arnold and Ruby have completely disappeared. I know if that was me and I had gotten out, I wouldn't have left without trying to get Ruby out. Why she left, I don't know. Why Arnold left, I don't know. If they left together, I don't know. I don't know why. So why did Arnold and Ruby leave their best friend trapped in an overturned car in the bitter cold? And how could two people just vanish? The answers to those questions wouldn't come until the spring thaw. By daybreak, the police were already searching through the area. The ice under the car was frozen solid, but they were afraid that Arnold and Ruby had wandered off and fallen through the ice somewhere else. We walked around the ice part. We had one officer walk on the opposite side of the railroad tracks, thinking maybe they wandered off toward the lake area, which was also frozen. I've been to a number of accidents where there hasn't been somebody around. The driver hasn't been there, no passengers there. And a lot of times, it's because they've been partying. That was initially my first thought. Maybe Arnold was out drinking and didn't want to get arrested. So we figured he'd show up in a few days. But friends and relatives couldn't accept that theory. I know he wouldn't hide. He would have came home to us or called us and told us, I'm over here, don't worry about me. But we never heard anything from him. Ruby is a real gentle person. She's always laughing. She jokes around. She never said any harsh words to us. And if she'd done anything wrong, she always told us that she did do something wrong. Over the next three months, Deputy Youngstrom investigated every possible lead, but he came up empty. 
until that spring. In early March, someone driving by saw a body in the ditch just 75 feet from the accident site. It was Ruby Bruyere. I was very shocked the morning that I received the radio transmission that they'd found a body. Of course, it wasn't broadcasted any names across, but I knew immediately who they had found. He was either going to be Ruby Breer or Arnold Archambault. Her glasses were missing, both shoes were missing, her clothes were intact. It appeared to be the same clothes that she had on the night of the accident. But the body was very decomposed. It was hard to recognize. And in fact, we had to get down to look at a tattoo to get a positive identification of the body. At that time, our department decided that we would start pumping the ditch out. And about noon the next day, we found the body of Arnold about 15 feet away from where we found Ruby, submerged in the water. Arnold's body was very well kept. His skin color was fine. He was not frozen to the ground. The clothes were not frozen to the ground. There is a question mark as far as in our investigation if he was wearing the same clothes that he was the night of the accident. How could two bodies found in the same location be in such different states of decomposition? And how could they end up in an area that had already been thoroughly searched? The bodies were immediately autopsied, but there was no way of determining the time of death. The coroner concluded that Arnold and Ruby had both died of exposure. But Deputy Youngstrom suspected foul play. Death by exposure is like they froze to death. And I cannot actually buy that. They may have froze to death, but they didn't freeze to death at that ditch. That's impossible that they could have been there the entire three months. I myself personally walked that ditch several times during that period. I've gotten written affidavits from people that's also watched, walked it, people that had nothing to do with the case. They couldn't have been there. They couldn't have been missed. Other evidence supported the theory that Arnold and Ruby had not died in the ditch. You want to come over here? I got something here. Alongside the road, we found a tuft of hair. This hair was later determined by the forensic laboratory to belong to Ruby Brewer. That hair couldn't have stayed there for three months. In my opinion, it was when whoever brought the bodies back to the ditch, that's when that piece of hair fell off a ruby. At the time we pulled Arnold's body from the ditch, I found a set of keys in his pocket. The keys were a car or vehicle key and what appeared to be two house keys. I still have these keys in my possession, and to this day, I have not found the vehicle nor the house that these keys fit. Hi, Arnold. What are you doing? Nothing. Just driving around. Then a witness came forward who said she had seen Arnold on New Year's Eve, almost three weeks after he was reported missing. All right, we we'll probably will. OK, then. All right, later. Later. In my mind, it is a very credible sighting. She talked to Arnold, knows Arnold personally, and was no doubt in her mind that it was Arnold that she was talking to. Do you think you were mistaken when you seen Arnold on New Year's Eve? No. The witness Arnold. passed the polygraph exam. The two people she said were in the back of Arnold's car failed their polygraphs. They denied being there, but they did fail the polygraph. We questioned those two people thoroughly afterwards, and they held to their story that they were not there that night. They never seen Arnold or Ruby during those three months and said that they were at home that evening. How did the bodies of Arnold and Ruby end up in the very same ditch where they crashed their car three months earlier? They had to die someplace else. They had somebody had to come and put them back in there again to make it look like that. That's where they died. I believe that someone done that. Yeah, someone killed Arnold. I really do believe that. But how, I don't know. If you have any information about the death of Arnold Archambault and Ruby Bruyere, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, an urban myth or a real ghost. Those who have met Chicago's Resurrection Mary are true believers in the paranormal.
you're on a dark, lonely road. The shadows seem to reach for you, and suddenly you feel the icy touch of someone or something. Well, chances are it's just your imagination. Unless, of course, you're on the road to Chicago's Resurrection Cemetery. One night, a Chicago cab driver found himself on that very road. He was about to have an experience he would never forget. Say, miss, I'm, I'm lost and can't find my way back to town. Look, if, uh, if you point me out the right direction, I'll, I'll give you a lift wherever you want to go free of charge, OK? Why don't you hop in? Just over a mile ahead was Resurrection Cemetery the final resting place of more than 150,000 souls. Stop here. Stop here. The cabbie parked across from the cemetery's front to gate. Stop here for? The mysterious passenger had vanished. The cab driver had just met Chicago's most famous ghost, Resurrection Mary. I think that of all the ghost stories worth believing in, Resurrection Mary is the one with the best documentation. The witnesses that I found are remarkably level-headed, and they're primarily blue-collar, middle-class types who have steady jobs and who uh, have no other major claims to psychic encounters in their life. As the story goes, the first person to ever encounter Resurrection Mary was Jerry Palis. The year was 1939. The place, one of Chicago's dance halls, where Jerry was a regular. Hey, you know that girl over there? I'm going to ask her to dance. Jerry described the woman as being blonde, about five foot seven. Her hair was about shoulder length, and she had curls along either side of her head. She was wearing a very fancy type party dress of the period, old fashioned to today's terms. It's Mary, isn't it? That's a pretty name. Jerry danced with the young woman you all night. Week. He learned little about her, except that her name was you. Mary and that she lived on the south side of town. Do you live near here? Your hands, they're like ice. He offered to give her a ride home. As we walked along the street, she says, well, you might as well take me down to Archer Road. And I said, what for? I said, you live uh, here and here, where, where you told me. And she says, no, she said, I want to go out to Archer Road. What do you want to come out here for? Stop. What? Stop the car. That's not exactly what Jerry expected. I need to get out of here, please. They were stopped in front of Resurrection Cemetery. Please, just wait right here. Jerry claimed that the young woman vanished before his eyes. The very next day, he went out to Damon Avenue, where Mary said she lived. Yes, can I help you? Excuse me, I don't mean to disturb you, but I'm looking for a young woman named Mary. I was told she lives here. You must be mistaken. There's no one here by that name. Wait, that's the woman I'm looking for in that picture. No, that's not possible. That girl is my daughter, and she has been dead for five years. And it's then Jerry said that he understood why the woman he was dancing with that night was ice cold to the touch. He had worked in a funeral home for a while, and it was the touch of a corpse. Mary Brugovi had been killed in a traffic accident one Saturday night in 1934, a month before her 21st birthday. She was laid to rest in Resurrection Cemetery in her favorite gown, a white gown. Over the years, Mary has been seen time and time again at dance halls, in taxis, and walking outside the cemetery looking for someone to take her home. I really didn't think there was any ghost. You hear these stories and these old ghost tales, but um, it's never happened to me. But now I um, must say I think I'm changing my mind. 
Claire Rudnicki, her husband Mark, and two friends were driving on Archer Avenue along the front of Resurrection Cemetery. And I was just looking out the window as we were going down the street. And on the right-hand side of the road, there was a girl walking. But look ahead. Look, it's a, it's a girl. She was bright, very bright, like illuminating. She was just walking very slow. I remember thinking, oh my god, it's Resurrection Mary. And I can feel my stomach starting to turn. Let's go back. No. I look. was very frightened. I have to admit, it did scare me. No, I don't want to go back. Let's go back. I don't want to go back. We all went past it, turned around and came back. And by the time we had gotten back to where we had originally seen her, it had gone, vanished. So what time are you leaving tomorrow? Mm. Around 7. -ish. On another night, Janet Kalal and a friend were out for an evening drive. <laughs> After about an hour, they found themselves at Resurrection Cemetery. She was all in white, and uh, her hair and the dress were, were flowing back. There was no impact. There was no bump to say that, you know, I had hit something. But I know she ran out. Um, the young woman ran out in front of my car and... Just calm down. Everything's going to be okay. And yet, nothing. No impact, no sound, nothing. My dad had told me the story about Resurrection Mary before because he had read it in the newspaper back in 1939. But I never thought that I would be party to it, uh, that I would see it myself, or that I would be with a friend who would have seen her. You can pick apart individual ghost stories, but when you come up with a story like Resurrection Mary, where we have dozens of reports spanning decades, I think you've got to go a long way to trying to undermine all that massive documentation. I like to drive past the cemetery to see if I can see her again. <laughs> I but never want to see her again. <laughs> I didn't believe in ghosts until I saw her. And the way I know it was really a ghost is you just know. Does the ghost of Mary Brugovi really haunt Chicago? Or is Resurrection Mary just an urban myth? Either way, if you find yourself driving in the city late one night and you see a pale young woman in a flowing gown, you might want to think twice about offering her a ride. Next, what caused the crash of TWA Flight 800? Some think it was brought down by a missile fired by our own military. July 17th, 1996. TWA Flight 800 crashes into the Atlantic off the coast of Long Island, killing 230 passengers and crew. I have found some people who have other information that I... Four months later, Pierre Salinger, former press secretary to President John Kennedy, makes a stunning allegation. He claims Flight 800 was shot down by a missile and that the Navy is trying to hide the truth. Despite Navy statements that they had nothing to do with the TW-800 crash, we have strong evidence that they are wrong. It's a rumor that just can't be ignored. Is it possible that Flight 800 was shot down by the U.S. military? And could there be a high-level conspiracy and cover-up? And if so, how could the hundreds of people involved keep such a terrible secret? After the tragedy, tons of debris was scooped off the ocean floor, and Flight 800 was rebuilt piece by piece. Officials narrowed down the cause of the crash to three possibilities. A bomb, mechanical malfunction, or a shoulder-launched terrorist missile. The missile theory was supported by more than 30 credible eyewitnesses. They claimed they saw a streak of light in the sky just before the explosion. However, missile expert Bud Sewell says those accounts could also support a bomb scenario. A terrorist bomb, if properly designed, would indeed give you a very bright, luminous streak out from the aircraft. 
so that it'd be very possible to have a design which could produce what the eyewitnesses said they saw. But eyewitness testimony, no matter how credible, cannot stand alone. As far as anyone knew, there was no physical evidence of a missile hit, much less one fired by the U.S. Navy, unless you believe Pierre Salinger. They are wrong. Before printing In March of 1997, Salinger produced several still frames of radar sweeps. He claimed they were recorded in the tower of New York's Kennedy Airport on the night of the tragedy. According to Paris Match magazine, Flight 800 is represented by this written designation. Circled on the right is a Navy plane, a P-3 Orion. Circled in the center is U.S. Air Flight 217. The object circled on the left is unidentified. The conspiracy camp believes it is a Navy surface-to-air missile. In this frame, reportedly recorded a second before the crash, the unidentified object has disappeared. The P-3 Orion, Flight 800, and U.S. Air 217 are all in close proximity, but are flying at different altitudes. In later frames, TWA 800 has vanished from the scope. The government says nothing conclusive has been found to indicate a missile hit. Pierre Salinger disagrees. Moreover, we have discovered that certain bodies on the plane were crushed by something which went through the plane, the missile. There is some circumstantial evidence that supports the conspiracy theory. The Navy has admitted that military exercises were being conducted off the Long Island coast the night of the crash. In fact, TWA 800 veered from its original flight path to avoid a restricted area. The Navy would almost certainly try to conduct exercises where they're not going to get in the way of shipping. And they don't really fire many missiles because the darn things cost a million dollars each. So they really don't do exercises. They assume that if they get a radar lock on with the ship, they will get a hit. And they just can't afford to shoot that many missiles. But suppose the Navy did fire a live missile that night. Where could it have come from? According to the Navy, the USS Normandy was the only ship in the area with standard missile capability. The Normandy was reportedly on maneuvers in the Atlantic 180 miles south of the crash site. The main problem is that the maximum range of the standard missile is 80 miles, and the Normandy was alleged to be 180 miles away from the incident. So it just, it just doesn't make sense. If a missile ship had been within the 80-mile radius to shoot it, the eyewitnesses would have seen a tremendous flash of light because the initial launch of a standard missile essentially lights up the night sky. But regardless of what they say, we have now reached the point where we are totally sure that what we are saying is true. There is another question. If the Normandy was within range and accidentally shot down the airliner, is it possible that the Navy could have engineered a successful cover-up? If it were a friendly fire incident, it would take approximately one day for everybody in the country to know it. You had, what, several hundred people on that ship how can you cover anything up? The sailors would write home to their sweethearts or their parents and say, my God, we did this. You couldn't. There's no way you could cover it up because sailors love to talk. But those in the conspiracy camp point out that the Navy has been less than candid in the past. When the USS Vincennes mistakenly shot down an Iranian airliner in 1988, Navy officials initially tried to justify the action with false information. They claimed the plane had been emitting military codes. They have since said that was not true. Could the same thing have happened with Flight 800? The Navy, after this incident, did a thorough inventory. I mean, they should with things that cost a million dollars. And they can account for every missile in the Atlantic fleet by serial number. On August 23, 2000, 
the NTSB released their final report. It stated that the probable cause was a design flaw in the center wing fuel tank. Pierre Salinger died in 2004, but many investigators, military experts, and airline pilots continued to insist the Boeing was shot down by a missile. But critics of the conspiracy are quick to point out that a cover-up would have to include not just hundreds of Navy personnel, but also hundreds of civilians involved with the investigation. The answers may lie somewhere at the bottom of the Atlantic. Next, two brothers are on the run after a home invasion. It was 7 a.m. Two masked intruders knew exactly what they were looking for. They cut the alarm at phone lines. Becky Wood's husband had left for work. Over the bed! Over the safe! When I first opened my eyes, I saw a man with blood on the head and the eye. And I thought, oh my God, I'm having this bad dream. And then when he said it again, I knew it was for real. Let's go! Come on, over the Becky's granddaughter was sleeping beside her. Becky hid her with a blanket. Three other children were asleep in other bedrooms. I never felt so helpless. Take it out, okay? Take it off! I was afraid for my grandchildren, and I kept praying to God, you know, please let the children sleep through this. Don't let them wake. The whole time he's screaming, where's the combination? Where's the combination? And I tried to explain to them that I didn't know it, I didn't have it with me. Could I please call my daughter? He kicked me in the head. And I kept trying, I swear I don't have the combination. I swear I would open that, I give it to you. I don't have it. Sounds of ransacking came from upstairs. The second intruder was tearing through Becky's dresser, looking for jewelry. The noise woke up nine-year-old Matthew. Here we got one up! I don't really know how to explain what I felt. My heart just felt like it was pounding real hard and all that, because I didn't know what it was. He threw Matthew on the floor and put his hands behind him and tied him up. I saw the man's feet coming around in front of me, and he took a trash bag and put it over my grandson's head. I thought they were going to take me out in this rug and kill me, and they were going to smother Matthew. You count to 2,000 before you move, or else we'll be back to kill you. Becky heard the safe drag across the floor. She heard her car starting, then silence. One of the other children woke up and cut Becky and Matthew free. Neighbors called the police. In addition to stealing Becky's car, the robbers made off with $20,000 worth of jewelry. They also took the locked safe containing another $18,000 in cash. Well, why they stole a lot of our possessions that I'll never be able to replace. I'm thankful we're alive. That afternoon, police found Becky's stolen vehicle at a nearby car wash. The empty safe turned up a week later. Police began to review the case. The intruders knew exactly where to disconnect the wires for the home alarm system and phones. They knew just where the safe was kept and where to look for Becky's jewelry. They knew too much to be total strangers. I'd met back up again with Becky and her husband, Woody. We asked them to sit down and start thinking about people they knew, people that they've dealt with, and people that have worked for them, and put a list together for us. Becky's jewelry showed up at pawn shops in Pittsburgh, 100 miles away. Police believed it had been sold by a man named Larry Juster. His picture was sent to Ohio.
Becky and her husband, Woody, asked their daughter to take a look. Sure. Listen, there's a photograph I need you to take a look at. You wouldn't happen to recognize this guy, would you? Yeah, it's Gary Noble. It's not Larry Juster? Mm, that's what the name says, but that's Gary Noble. And his brother, Ted Noble, worked for my dad a couple months ago. When Gary and his brother, Ted, found out that detectives were closing in, they took off. We were given information that they had made statements that they had no intention of being taken alive if confronted by law enforcement. The way we entered our warrants is with extreme caution on the two of them. Update. Police discovered that Gary Noble was working with a construction crew at the football stadium being built in Nashville for the Tennessee Titans. They sent an agent out there, and as he was pulling in, Gary was pulling out. He got caught in traffic. And by the time he caught back up with the car, there were two people in the car. Uh, they got into a chase. Uh, eventually, they ended up having to ram the car in order to get Gary and Ted to stop, and then they placed him under arrest. Gary Noble was taken into custody and led to a patrol car where his brother Ted was already being held. I was shocked that it all came around like it did. And I hope someday they learn what fear is. And I hope they get what's coming to them. Ted and Gary Noble pleaded guilty to charges of theft, burglary, robbery, and tampering with evidence. They each received the sentence of three to 15 years. They served their time and have been released. Next. A killer leaves behind his checklist for murder, and now he's behind bars, thanks to you. In a previous program, we told you about the tragic murder of a 61-year-old grandmother, Ethel Kidd. Ethel retired to Virginia and she lived down the road from her daughter and son-in-law, Joanne and Thomas. Thomas would be the first to notice that something was wrong. The next morning, my wife called her mother about 7.30, and the answering machine answered. And she said, that's funny, Mom must have left early. Either she's on her way here to have a cup of coffee. But at 9.30, I rode by, and I saw the car there. It was a bad sign. If Ethel had left, she would have taken her car. Curiously, a road atlas lay open in the front yard. Then, another bad sign. Ethel? Ethel never left the door unlocked. Ethel, are you here? There was no trace of Ethel Kid anywhere. Then days later, Ethel's body was discovered in the woods nearby. Come on, let's go through here. We haven't searched over here yet. So just follow me right on through here. She had been sexually assaulted, strangled, and left tied to a tree. The killer is extremely brazen. It's even as if he may have been taunting the police, uh, saying, catch me if you can. Investigators believe the road atlas found in Ethel's driveway was their best clue. At a Virginia forensic lab, technicians were able to pull fingerprints from several pieces of paper that were found in the atlas. One of the papers was a checklist for murder. But without a suspect, the prints were useless. Update. After our program aired, a woman called to report that she recognized the handwriting on this checklist. She said it had been written by her brother, Edward Wayne Beverly. Beverly lived in Burr Hill, Virginia, just a few miles from Ethel Kidd. Shortly after the murder, he suddenly left town. Virginia authorities finally located Edward Beverly in a Tennessee prison where he was serving time for armed robbery. We compared fingerprints, and they matched to Mr. Beverly's prints. Okay. And on the victim's body, there was evidence there indicating sexual contact. 
and we compared Mr. Beverly's blood through DNA testing, and that matches up also. I'm convinced that we have the right guy that did this crime. I'm lost. Can you show Based me on the evidence Beverly? that's available. Oh, yes. Edward Beverly was identified just months before his scheduled release from prison. He was extradited to Virginia to stand trial. Beverly was convicted on all charges, abduction, sodomy, and first-degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison and died behind bars. Dan Willems, a Canadian prospector, spent his entire life searching for gold. When he died, he left an unclaimed estate that some say is worth as much as $3 million. But his heirs and his real identity are still a mystery. Dan Willens was one of thousands who poured into Canada in the 1920s, hoping to strike it rich. He settled in the rough mining town of Haleybury, Ontario. Oh, he's not laughing. There we he go. He spent his nights playing poker and his days hoping to find that one strike that would make his fortune. Gentlemen, the game is yours. <laughs> Dan didn't talk much about himself not even to his partner, Bill Koshner. Thanks a lot, Dan. Okay. He was very yeah. private. I don't know if I ever listened to him ever brag about himself. Never, never. Or comment about his past. Never, never. I consider him as a gentleman, gentleman. And his walk and his stance, I would take it to be a military man. One night, another miner told Dan and Bill that there might be gold in Red Lake. 850 miles to the west. Well, here it is, mm -hmm. right here. I've staked some claims on this point, and I've got some real good showings. It took Dan and Bill more than a month to get through the desolate outback. In 1927, Dan and Bill staked 12 claims around Red Lake. From that small beginning, one of Canada's most profitable gold mines sprang to life. At today's values, the Koshner Willens mine produced a billion dollars worth of gold. But running a mining company didn't interest Dan. His real love was panning for gold. Often he would disappear into the wilderness alone for months at a time. But there was another side to Dan Willens the rough outdoorsman led a double life as a refined gentleman. Every fall, he would trek to the elegant King Edward Hotel in Toronto, take over an entire floor, and throw parties for weeks. Then he would disappear again into the backcountry. He had a, a social life that very few people knew anything about, and he loved life. He, there's no doubt about it, he loved life. He liked sociability, there was no doubt about this. Dan Willens kept up this double life for years. Then, in the autumn of 1936, he vanished while on one of his prospecting trips. When he disappeared, it, the story was that he'd taken a trip into the bush and he was never heard of again, that he was lost, that he perished. Now, Dan was a good bushman, and he wasn't a weak man. He was a very strong man. And I don't think for one minute that he was lost. I think he went back to England and took his social place in life. I'm in for five. Five? Is that all? Hmm. However, some believe that Dan may have been killed after a poker game and his body thrown down an abandoned mine shaft. Take a chance. If you got into a poker game, it's just hard to say what might have happened. Money and losers don't work too well together, especially if they lose their money. Eh? Okay, I'll see you five and I'll raise 20. He was a good poker player. Dan's background is as mysterious as his disappearance. Only a handful of clues exist. He appeared to be from England and may have had a sister. He was a skilled horseman and just as skilled at cards. He never married and has no known heirs. Today, his unclaimed estate is worth millions if a descendant can be found. Terry Howes is a Toronto-based investigator who locates missing heirs. He has learned that Dan may have been a nickname. 
We have reason to think that his real name was Dalton Thomas Williams, and we feel that there are heirs either in Britain or the U.S., somewhere in the world. Today, if an heir turned up, and we have every reason to think that their heirs are going to turn up, uh, the estate could be worth in the vicinity of $3 million, depending upon the interest that's been paid over the years. Update. Within days of our broadcast, Davey Willens, a New York businessman, contacted us, claiming that he might be one of the heirs to the Willens fortune. My grandfather, we have determined, came from the UK to Ontario in 1895. At that time, he was 11 years of age. We believe he traveled with another family member. And we also have been told that there was a cousin someplace up in the outback of Ontario. But there was never any contact with that individual through the years. So when this Unsolved Mysteries program aired and this Dan Willens, a bushman from Ontario, was, was disclosed, it certainly was an exciting possible link for our family tree searching. Davey Willens flew to Toronto to meet Joe Perkins, one of Dan's last surviving friends. He brought along photographs of his grandfather, Harold Willens, and his great-grandfather, John Willens, to see if there was a family resemblance. It was uncanny. I couldn't believe it. The similarity of the face, the nose, spacing of the eyes, forehead. Our great-grandfather, John, grandfather, Harold, and prospector, Dan Willens, all blood relatives. Is Davy an heir to the Willens fortune? Davy says there may be a box in one of Dan Willens' old mines that contains some of the prospector's belongings. He is hoping to find a DNA sample which can be used to confirm that he is the rightful heir. It will probably be many, many years before a final determination can be made.